From Corolla One Studios in Glendale, California, this is the Adam Corolla Show. Adam's guest today, author Marshall Terrell. With Gina Grad on news and Bald Brian on sound effects, and now his face is red because his state is blue. Adam Carolla. Yeah, get it on. Not to get it on, no choice but to get it on your mandate. You get it on. Thanks for tuning in and thanks for telling a friend. Good day, Gina Grand. Good day to you. Handball, Brian. Boom. It's uh, 97 degrees outside. Nuts. It's a nice day. At least, yeah. yeah. It is hotter than snot over here, and we're past Halloween now. So uh, enough is enough, y'all. Well, we're would you like to know? Hmm? What? They're almost past the election. That's right. Would right. you like to know the nosedive we'll be taking over the weekend? Oh, I am so pumped about uh, being like rainy and 57 yep. oh, yeah. on, Just be like on 60 Saturday. and rainy. Oh, yeah. I cannot wait. All right. A um, <clears throat> bunch of stuff to uh, get into today. First, just a, a side observation. I was doing a Forbes podcast today, and the guy who interviewed me, I think his name was Sean. Anyway, he said, uh, you've been around Trump a few times, spent some time with Trump. What's what's Trump like in real life? And I said, he's just Trump. He's, he's maybe even Trumpier in real life. <laughs> and there's certain people that are just that way. They're just them, more of them. And then I thought, you know, it's funny. I always laugh at politicians like Hillary Clinton used to do this when she got up in front of the black church and she started with all the y'alls and everything and started the hot sa- sauce in her purse. sounding she leans in. Yeah. yeah. Sa- start sounding black. And a lot of politicians uh, do it. Um, I thought I've seen Trump do a thousand rallies. and He never changes his voice. And that's oh, no. kind of that. That would be him versus like Hillary Clinton, for instance. Like Hillary Clinton, it wants to be all things to all people, and Trump is just Trump. Yep. And it, love it or hate it, he's just Trump. But I thought changing your voice is a very interesting yardstick to kind of measure that because you get up in front of a crowd, and one mind says, I want to be of this crowd. I want this crowd to feel like I'm one of sure. them. And the other goes, hey, I'm doing the talking here. Where's the microphone? You know? Mm-hmm. So it's 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 an interesting dynamic. I don't know if it's good or if it's bad, but it's a pretty good example of Trump just being Trump. I've never, whenever they do one of those rallies, he's in Georgia and he's in Florida and he's, he's in, he's, he's in Texas. Like you couldn't tell his voice or, no. or even the words he chooses. You, you couldn't, no. you could do 10 rallies at 10 places that were as diverse and as different as one another could be. And you would never know the difference between how he sounded. Uh, Nary a yippee ki to be no. true. No. So well, that's a huge, huge part of his appeal. Yeah, right? so, I, yeah, I thought that was an... I, I, I never thought about the dynamic behind changing your voice. The dynamic is, is I want to fit in with this group. I want this group to love me, and I want them to think I'm, I'm amongst them. Of, I'm, I'm them, yeah. I'm them. I'm their people. You know, hmm. you know who did that, ironically, uh, was uh, Obama. Obama would definitely lean in and become a little more of, Folksy. let's just say, where, wherever he was. Yeah, he was given the State of the Union. You know, he'd see that sounds very different. Yeah, he, I, you know, what he, or at least all I noticed from him is he was a black man, is a black man that doesn't have any of the characteristics audibly of a black man, doesn't speak in the vernacular and all that kind of stuff. When he then would get in front of a black group, he would ratchet up the black. Oh yeah. Natural. You know, another, another example of the Trump thing, you know, another indicator, and it's, I think it's probably easier to tell on women, his clothing never changes. Yeah. Not like today I'm going to wear my dungarees and my, uh, you know, right. my cowboy shirt. There's, there's none of that. Yeah, it's a good point. He doesn't. He never ha- rolls the sleeves up. Don't do no, the sleeve turns roll. the chair around. <laughs> no, yeah, when, yeah, when Biden and a lot of other guys like tour the caterpillar plant, 
off comes the tie, the sleeves get right. rolled up, and they look like I hey I might I may have worked here a few years ago. Mm-hmm. You know that, that right. kind of thing. That's sure. a good point. All right, um, I got uh, some stuff. Uh, so we're gonna do uh, a live version of Slippery Slope Guy, and Sorry. we're gonna do that in the second hour. We'll see how that goes. If it doesn't go well, I blame the callers. I really do. Yeah. Don't internalize to put it back on them. Because I don't, I, I suspect we're going to get a lot of joke questions or joke answers, but maybe we'll get some just straightforward stuff or maybe it'll just be a challenge to work with the the people and figure it and figure it out. All right. So, uh, we will do a slippery slope guy live in the, uh, in the next hour. Um, I have a uh, quick minute and 30 second uh, unprepared to play for you guys. I don't know what the subject of this one is, Max Apata. Heartburn. Heartburn. Mm. Wow. These are things never are insane. I, I never have any idea what what I said uh, during this thing. So it's always a surprise. Yeah, and this is this is when we did it in Chicago in January. So we sell the ping pong balls. Oh, OK. Here we go. Heartburn. Heartburn. Uh, I've never had heartburn in my life, and I fucking love seeing people who suffer from heartburn. (laughs) I love watching commercials, and it's, by the way, it's always white people who want to have the pizza, but they can't. (laughs) By the way, Then in the middle of realizing they want the pizza, but the heartburn is too much, at some point they pull out the medication that they had on them the entire time. So why didn't they fucking know that when they left the car? Why go through that emotional roller coaster where you're like, hey, we're at an Italian restaurant. Oh, I can't eat pizza. Wait a minute, there's this thing in my pocket. (laughs) Wouldn't you have that knowledge walking into Pinocchio's? I just decided to call my Italian restaurant Pinocchio's. I'm looking for a specific name. Two guys from Italy? (laughs) How many heartburn sufferers do we have here? What do you eat? What do you want to eat that I can eat with total impunity later on tonight? I'm going to feel good about myself. Uh, What's that? Pizza and beer? They give you? They give you heartburn? Yeah. Although pussy would be a good one. I know, honey. I don't have my Zantac tonight. Yeah. Uh, Speaking of heartburn, there's a little summer sausage down here that could use some attending to as long as we're talking. And there it is. Heartburn. Well done. Everybody. Yeah, well done. You do have innards of steel. It is a marvel. Yeah, I know a lot of it is just kind of genetic, your flora and your fauna, as uh, Drew would say. But... I got to believe no antibiotics and rolling around in the dirt. I literally dug in the dirt. I made forts in the dirt a lot. Like I made caves, like I dug caves when I was a kid. I I, Mm -hmm. finally, I got smart and I'd make a trench and throw a piece of wood over the top of it and then throw the dirt on top of the wood. It's an easier way to uh, handle a cave. But I rolled around in the dirt and I never, even as an adult, I never got medication for things. And one time I had strep throat so bad that it's just, I was in exquisite pain. I couldn't swallow whatever. I, I literally did nothing for like four days. And then eventually I went to an emergency room and I just sat in the emergency room for like two hours. And I went, ah, fuck it. I went home, but I never took any antibiotics or any medication for it. I, I wouldn't take as, as much as an aspirin when I was a kid. So there was no remedies. And my mom we, was the kind of health food nut. So she didn't like all that shit, you know, all the right. stuff you right. swig she and really all that. St. John's Ward. Right, right. She liked all the shit that didn't work at all. Right. So <laughs> that was uh, a little eye of newt and a little whisker mm-hmm. of the rat. Mm-hmm. So I went from zero to, you know, my mid thirties without, without physically putting anything in my body 
and, you know, sleeping on the floor, essentially. I, you know, I had, uh, you know, I had a cat, Norman. He was like an indoor, outdoor cat. He'd go hang around under the neighbor's house all day and then come sleep on my bed, you know. I would, uh, I, I just had a, it, and maybe playing football and Pop Warner and having all that contact, like physical, sweaty contact with kids. My, I, my number one sport, my form of entertainment, my number one pastime was wrestling. I would wrestle with everyone. I would wrestle with the neighbor kids. I would just, anyone who wanted to wrestle, we would wrestle. So maybe all the spit and all the sweat and all the whatever and all the football and all all that, maybe that's what just created this thing, which, which I don't, again, heartburn or diarrhea or all, all this stuff. First off, whatever food does to you, food does nothing to me any of the time. Well, that's the thing that's the most impressive because back in the day when we used to travel, we all used to travel together and we'd go to these restaurants and we'd do all this stuff and we'd have a show and then we'd be in for a long drive. I would have to do some real math. Being like, oh, all right, how long are we going to be in the car? Yeah. When do we hit the stage? I don't know if my system can handle uh, Hungarian food and then pizza and then whatever we're doing. I don't, I don't know if this is a good idea, but you have no thoughts about it. No, and I, I never did. And, and also maybe this dovetails into my sort of low self-esteem in that if somebody made something, I ate it. That was the mm. policy. I, I would never turn down you food. You sustenance. Yeah. I literally, I would go to everyone else's house and just eat at their house. And I had no dietary requests or issues. My request was, can I sit in on your dinner? Your request was seconds. Right. So that was, that was it. And maybe, maybe that, that sort of turned into a perfect yeah. storm that uh, created my, my flora and my fauna. But uh, now there is no... No, anything. I'm always surprised at how many people I know who are on this medication or yeah, that yeah. medication. Yeah, Brian. You should ask Drew about this because I experience. So naturally, I don't get heartburn that often. However, when I was first put on medication 11 years ago, uh, it causes a lot of heartburn, and so like my reflux. doctor, yeah, and my doctor prescribed Prilosec, which I've never been on, but I took it every day. It worked. I never got to heartburn during my treatment. However, when I finished the Prilosec about a year a yearish later, I was I went off it. My body had stopped producing whatever it is that like suppresses heartburn. And I got heartburn all the time. Like at the drop of a hat every day. I had to like, my body had to like, uh, I guess, re start producing whatever suppresses, you know, heartburn. Yeah. You should ask Drew about that. If that's a common, not common, but amongst people who are on medication, if it kind of uh, interferes with the body's natural ability, as you kind of alluded to, to make that anti whatever. Inflammatory. Well, yeah, no free lunches in nature, as Drew always says, and it just makes sense that if you suppress something, then your body, you know, sort of from the outside, if you sort of artificially suppress mm -hmm. something, then your body's going to slow down. I mean, that that's all we do. I always marvel at uh, people can get a 90 Vicodin a day habit and still work at a law firm. You know, it's like... You know, you're body just adapts. just trying to your body just wants yeah. they want once that stasis just wants to get right back to the middle. All right. Oh, yeah. This article. Did we get into this uh, article with the Indian people having more immunes? You did with Drew. Oh, with Drew. Uh, yeah, and Adam Drew. Show, well, this but... is a good time to get somebody. Yeah, so. Somebody tweeted me an article about how uh, India seems to be doing better with the the COVID. Yeah. So the BBC posted an article. Uh, and saying that new research by Indian scientists from the Council of Scientific and Industrial Research suggests that low hygiene, lack of clean drinking water, and unsanitary conditions may have actually saved many lives from severe COVID-19. And uh, it says India is a sixth of the world's population, a sixth of the, of the reported cases. However, it accounts for only 10% of the world's deaths from the virus, and its case fatality rate which measures deaths among COVID-19 patients, is less than 2%, which is among the lowest in the world. So they propose that people living in low- and middle-income countries may have been able to stave off severe forms of the infection because of exposure to various pathogens from childhood, which give them sturdier immunity to COVID-19. 
And they also talk about the microbiomes that we've gone into as well. So it's interesting. It's yeah. interesting. It, it doesn't stop you from being infected, but it just doesn't run through your body like it runs through our bodies. And, you know, it is interesting, some of the third world stuff. I, and maybe we're just snobs, but all I ever hear is uh, how uh, Germany and Italy's doing and how Florida's doing. I don't hear anything about Africa. No. I, you know, I wonder yeah, how many reliable statistics there are because I don't hear much about that either. It's like it, they don't exist. And you would think that these places would be decimated, these, you know, th- these poor right. countries that don't have access to ventilators and all the other shit we used to think worked. But I'm starting and I I'm starting to think probably it's for the same reason. Probably these people aren't being decimated or I'm sure if Africa was being decimated, CNN for sure would let me know about it every eight oh, minutes. Yeah, right? Well, well, be at, having a concert. And at the very least, we know how good vitamin D is to fight this thing. And if you're in a sunny environment and you're outside a lot, that's got to help as well. Right. Like in many African countries. Yeah. All right. Uh, so speaking of, uh, decimated populations and, uh, living in uh, squalor, I told you guys, I passed the Lord of the Flies fort off the, uh, 101 freeway the other day. Um, Oh, a new submission. I sent, uh, I sent young, lest you think I be, I, I exaggerate it all. I sent, uh, intern Ryan over there to film it from his, uh, from his phone and I want you to see what I think is kind of a, a new high, possibly new low in homeless construction. So he's getting off the 101 freeway mm-hmm. and uh, what park do I keep screwing up this one? This every time? Echo Park. A- at Echo Park. And he's filming. There is, you can see there's a mound of leaves in a circle. Oh my God. And, and palm fronds have been stuck on it to create oh. a perimeter. You'll yeah. see as he yeah. as he goes it's by. Like, yeah. Like an elaborate kids fort. They they made a oh, fort wow. has been made by also uh I think about this a lot. Uh I don't know, doesn't it sound dangerous to sleep next to a freeway? Mm-hmm. Well, of course. Doesn't sure. that I mean for whatever whatever rules we have, whatever rules we don't enforce, what good or bad. Could we at least go, hey, man, you can't sleep on on the off ramp like we, well, we do have we have to intervene here. Yeah, we're one hundred and fifty yards away from a freeway and our backyard gets very dirty, very fast. Like it, it, it cannot be safe to be wherever that guy is 70 yards away from the freeway or less 50. Right. Right. Um, there's another submission that came to us. Uh, yesterday, a uh, listener sent this to me on Instagram. This is where is it on the uh, Chris? I think you said the 405 in Venice. Yeah, and I'll, I'll put the video. Up and and because we've been talking about the new structures that they're using, you know, if it's two stories or you know whatever, check this out for a little more privacy when you're building your encampment. Tell me how sweet this is from your neighbors. Wow. <laughs> they grab the the green fencing from wherever just to give a little more privacy. Oh, I know and those so guys. Just, I know that encampment. Yeah, they, that, that, that's near you. Far from my house. <laughs> they right. literally took that kind of garden privacy green screed material and and it was strung on like mobile fencing and created wow. a a shade that was seven foot high in the, it's a gated community. the that's, that's entire smart. length of, <laughs> but okay. I don't know what to say. Why? These are, these aren't homeless people anymore, Adam. All these are actual homes now. <laughs> these are, this is a community. This what? is a neighborhood. Right. Is I, do we not have people who work for the city? Like can't, don't people show up and go, Hey, this is a fire hazard or Hey, I mean, so now you're a mom and you, what was that off? What was that overpass? Uh, right. The 405 in Venice. Venice. All right. Venice Boulevard. All right. Yeah. So you got to walk your kids somewhere. How do we do this now? You walk in the Take street. Take the long way. You, you go around and just walk. You just walk in the the street with the traffic. Like You don't you, walk of, under there. Of course, the, the fencing's tagged. <laughs> Jesus. Did you notice that? Yes, yeah. I did. I did. 
God damn. It is pretty crazy. It is insane. Is that a USC tent? Oh, hard times. <laughs> Jesus Christ. All right. Uh let's see. Let me check uh what else uh what else I have here. Um mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Oh uh uh Max Patter brought this up a few a few uh days back, but I just kind of been sitting on it for a while, which is uh the model uh Emily Rat Radikowski. Radikowski. Yes. I guess she's pregnant, but she's not going to. Yeah. So whenever anyone asks if it's a boy or girl, her and her husband have been responding. We won't know the baby's gender until it's eighteen. Till it's eighteen. Yeah. Oh, oh, that's a twist I wasn't expecting. Yeah. So, what's her husband now? Is her husband just going along with her because she's hot, or is, I would? Is he into? Yeah. <laughs> or is he into this too? <laughs> I mean, how many fucking husbands have to go down this road now? Like, like you married the super hottie model. She's mm-hmm. crazy. She's ultra woke. She's got some policies and you have to just sit there and kind of suck it up. Like you, you can't put your foot down or how does, well, how does this, how does it work practically? Like, I don't know what this guy does for a living, but I assume he's rich by his name. Sebastian Bear McClard. Oh wow. yeah, hyphenated. You should be on a yacht. Yes, yeah. From the McClard family. Out. Yes, right. Yes. The Bear McClards. The McClard estate. Yes. He's an actor and producer. Yes, he ah, owns sure. a mansion and a yacht. Oh, <laughs> so he just has to go along, or and then how does he? When they're talking about their kid, are they allowed to say she or him or her, or they just have to say the kid's name all the time? Yeah, can you pick her up from school? Okay, what is he getting into? Can you go keep an eye on him? There's a lot of examples. It's going to get tedious. <laughs> it, it it really just, it, it, it also, you know, it's sort of getting back to it. Like, I know a family, and I think the daughter's, like, deathly allergic to dairy or something. She has a real problem with some food or some spice mm-hmm. or something. And it's kind of a full-time job. Like every time you go out to dinner, you have to go, now listen, and I have right. a request. You know, like it, it keeps you busy. Yep. It, it makes, it, 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 it makes, it's not a carefree childhood because there's a lot of work that has to go into it. I feel like this is that. This is, this is a <laughs> lot of work. But it's yeah. self-imposed. Right, right. But also, um, I have a boy and a girl. They're fine. Uh, my son likes being a boy and my daughter likes being a girl and they have different interests and it's kind of how nature works. I don't, uh, it, it's also an interesting thing, which is why this subject, like why are we trying to break this down? I mean, right. what, what could be more natural than a boy and a girl? And male and female, like what, what is you, uh, if you want to just talk about nature and I'm sure Emily loves nature, isn't, isn't this kind of the ultimate nature? Yeah. What, what, what problem is this addressing? <laughs> like what societal deficit? And if the kid's going to be transgender, let's just say it'll be pretty obvious, pretty quick, won't it? Well, I mean, maybe I, not like in the, maybe not in the cradle, but like within a few years, you're going to know that kid's got an interest that, that varies. I think the answer is kind of in the announcement, which is um, the answer is I've announced this. So that's all. I mean, uh, that's why they're doing it. You know what I mean? Because right. let's just say that was your plan. Let's just say you and Christy were, were doing that. Don't you feel like that's kind of a private, personal thing? Yeah, there's no, there's no need to broadcast that. All right. Uh, ooh, we got some uh, we got some Slippery Slope guy ooh. stuff lined yep, up. These All are right. good so far. All right, so we'll take a break. We got some decent ones lined up. We'll come back with Slippery Slope guy right after this. All right, we'll come back, and uh, we can play video first before we... Okay. Yeah. Adam Carollas, I'm your emotional support animal, navigating our all-woke, no-joke culture, has over a thousand five-star reviews on Amazon. Here's one. Some of the language is a little read for me. 
but I stopped carrying after a while because it was so funny. It is funny, dude. Thanks, Oz. Pick up I'm Your Emotional Support Animal, navigating our all-woke, no-joke culture, and leave your five-star review on Amazon. Get all the links at adamcarolla.com. All right, we'll play you guys uh, a random slippery slope guy just so you can, uh, you can, you can get it, and then uh, we'll roll, roll into the live version of it. And now, an editorial from Slippery Slope Guy on medical marijuana. Does marijuana have some medical value? Maybe. But it's a slippery slope. First, your doctor's prescribing pot for your mother's glaucoma. Then he's treating your kid's head lice with hashish. And the next thing you know, a gang of government-funded hippies has stormed your house and forced your infant to mainline a speedball, and there's not a damn thing you can do about it! <laughs> well, probably won't be as clean as that one, but uh, <laughs> that, that could have been several takes there. But let's start with uh, Clay in Portland. Clay? Hi, guys. How you doing? Hi, guy. Hey. I uh, hope everyone's doing okay. Um, thanks for taking my call. Yeah. Uh, so, so yeah, uh, I guess my suggestion, um, it actually involves a slope. Um, so it would be wheelchair ramps, you know, the kind you need to get into buildings and stuff like yeah, that. Sure. Wheelchair ramps. All right. Let's see if we can do this. Oh, man, I probably needed some music, Max Apata. Uh, I just texted I think I gave you a tough one. <laughs> hmm? Uh, I'll go dry on this one, and then maybe we'll, we'll do the next one. Yeah, we'll one. love mm. Are wheelchair ramps... <laughs> All right, let me try again. Hey. Are, are wheelchair ramps necessary and good? Perhaps. <laughs> but it's a slippery slope. First, it's a wheelchair ramp to get onto the curb. Then it's a wheelchair ramp to get into the restaurant. The next thing you know, it's a wheelchair ramp to get into your daughter's vagina, and there's not a damn thing you can do about it. Well done. That's the best I got. <laughs> That's good. Maybe well we should, done. Maybe we should wrap it up now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man, that was your closer. Uh, let's see. We got... Um, Kids playing soccer. Let me talk to, uh, let's see. Robert? Mijo? Mijo! 39 from I got a good, uh, Castro Valley. I got a good one for you, Ace. American kids playing soccer. Mm, okay. Is American kids playing the European sport of soccer a good thing? Perhaps. But it's a slippery slope. First, we've adopted soccer from the European nations. Then the next thing you know, our kids are eating crepes and drinking champagne. And the next thing you know, we've adopted their religion. We've adopted their parliament. We have become European and we have no choice but to speak French. Otherwise, we'll be taken to a gulag and there's not a damn thing you can do about it. Oh. At the music. Thank you. Oh, well done. That's good. I got one for you. Okay. Um, I, I don't know what kind of slippery slope this could possibly be, uh, but something that that I, I love people who do this, fostering kittens. Rescue Fo kittens. Fostering kittens. Rescue kittens. Is fostering kittens and rescuing kittens a good thing? Perhaps. But it's a slippery slope. First, you foster a kitten. Then you foster a puppy. Then you foster a rhino. And then the next thing you know, there's a T-Rex in your living room eating your child. And there's not a damn thing you can do about it. I have a lot to rethink. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. You don't want the T-Rex in your living room? <laughs> I don't know well, how the fostering slow. works, but I imagine that you could do it on <laughs> any just animal. take kittens for a couple of weeks. All right, let's see. Uh, this is a tricky one. Marco, 46, Albany, uh, New York. Albany. Albany. Hola. Nice Hola. to be back. Brian, Gina. You look lovely. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, uh, slippery slope. Adding justices to the Supreme Court. Ripped from the headlines. Adding justices to the Supreme Court. All right. <clears throat> Is adding justices to the Supreme Court a good thing? Perhaps. But it's a slippery slope. First, you pack the court. Then, you start passing legislation. Then, you find out that this legislation... Ah, oh, fuck. I, <laughs> I, I was wondering where that one. was going <laughs> I'm out of fucking steam on this one. <laughs> All right, I got another one for you. Oh, you know what? Because... Packing the court is already a slippery slope. It's already right. it's already it's there. Heavy. It's it's right. we got to the finish line. That is that is the finish line, Marco. It's hard to find the irony. Yeah. yeah. Sorry, I crapped out on that one. <laughs> I got That's one. That's all right. You're oh. still the best. Thanks. Dawson's got one. Counting every vote. <clears throat> <clears throat> Timely. <laughs> okay. It is counting every vote a good thing? Perhaps. But it's a slippery slope. First, we count every vote. Then, we count every vote from every dead person that ever lived in Florida or Wisconsin. Then, we start counting votes and voting on politicians that aren't even alive. And the next thing you know, Spiro Agnew is running the country and there's not a damn thing you can do about it. Well done. That was very good. That'd be a nice yeah, he has to have been dead for a while, right? God willing. All right. Let's see. Lisa. Lisa from Cleveland. Yes. Mm-hmm. What's so your? Uh, I think question? the slippery slope I'm thinking of is the hashtag hero. There were veterinarian heroes and healthcare heroes. Mm-hmm. Now the grocery store heroes work here. Mm-hmm. I think she just did it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> is is labeling everyone a hero a good thing? Perhaps, but it's a slippery slope. First, the grocery store people are heroes. Then the nurses are heroes. Then the doctors are heroes. Then the crossing guards are heroes. Then the truck drivers are heroes. Then the ranchers are heroes. Then the pedophiles are heroes. And it's a slippery slope because there's not a damn thing you can do about it. That was perfect. Well done. Forehead temperature <laughs> scans. All right, let's try <laughs> that one. What's the possible slippery slope? <laughs> Joe, 41. All the women in Seattle, you need to have sex with Joe. Right, Gina. Oh, Thanks I said that. Again. All right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. What's going on, well, Joe? I feel it just bears repeating whatever possible, because as sure. far as I can tell, the women in Seattle have mostly not gotten the message, so it might be a COVID <laughs> thing, though. I don't, I don't know. Oh, this, Gina, I'm just getting caught up with some old episodes, but you remember when you were saying, I have a big secret about the movie Hocus Pocus. I have this, I have this big surprise I want to tell you. I thought you were going to say that Sarah Jessica Parker, I, this is this is true in real life, she turns out, and she was doing research for the role, she was descended from a real witch in the Salem uh, witch tri- I mean, not a person who was tried as a real witch. I assume not an actual oh, real witch. But, that's uh, a great Snapple that, fact. That is actually where I wow. thought you, when you said, oh, I have this awesome thing about the movie I want to tell I you. I never I, said I, it was I awesome. You were going there. <laughs> well great done. Story. Thank you. All right. Go ahead, Joe. What do you got? Forehead temperature scans. Oh. Forehead temperature scans. Are they a good idea? Perhaps, but it's a slippery slope. First, you have to get the forehead temperature scan to enter the building. Then, you have to get fingerprinted before you get on the airplane. Then, you have to perform oral on a captain before he takes the plane off. And then you have to get a retinal scan to tell your child you love them and there's not a damn thing you can do about it. All right, oh, I'm out God, of gas. I don't gas. think we're going to get better than that. All right. All right, we'll do that again. Well done. I, I yeah, blew nice. my voice out. Thanks. Yeah, it's been been a while. Oh, Literally, all we do is sit here and laugh and watch you tap dance. So <laughs> that that's 
That was a, a good, good bit. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, we'll do it. Uh, put it. Keep it in the hopper there. We'll do it once a week yeah, or something. Um, all right. Let me hit uh, stamps.com and then we'll uh, get in some other subjects I wanted to get into. Uh, as we uh, adjust to our new normal, we still need to be smart about how we do business. Luckily, oops, let me hang up here. Luckily, stamps.com is around. We, they've been around. We've been working with these guys for 10 years, uh, over 10 years now. We send out merch. We send out books. We send out paperwork. Whether you're a small business sending invoices, uh, online seller, shipping products, or just working from home, you need to mail stuff. Stamps.com lets you buy and print U.S. postage for any letter, any package, 24-7. Do it at home. Uh, do it from the convenience of your own home. Five cents off every first class stamp, up to 62% discount on USPS and U, sorry, and UPS shipping rates as well. Special offer, four week trial. Um, you can try it out, free postage and a digital scale, no long term commitment. Just go to stamps.com, click on the microphone, top of the home page, and type in Adam. That's stamps.com. Enter Adam. All right. I was sitting around last night and I was kind of thinking about uh, COVID and, and I realized the biggest disconnect I think we have is we are looking at it as a kind of equal opportunity killer and it was presented to us as an equal opportunity killer and it's something I was screaming about from day one, like what are the ages of the people that are dying? How old are they? That's something, well, remember I was asking about that when we were talking to uh, your newsman, all Steve those- Gregory, but we didn't know yet. I mean, yeah, we, you know. Well, yeah, but when a guy in a nursing home that's 84 dies, you can have that information. I right, don't, but we didn't know why the county wasn't <clears throat> releasing it. I don't think, Anybody in any newsroom or any county representative was interested in giving us perspective. They weren't mm -hmm. giving us perspective. Agreed. There is a massive, I mean, obviously I have a 87 year old mom who's not well. I have a 14 year old daughter who is well. The difference between those two being claimed by this disease is the difference between um, a sad a sad moment in time and total devastation, mm -hmm. a, a, a life destroyed. That's the difference between those two, this, just those two getting the disease, two, two women in my life. That, that is the difference. And we didn't get perspective. And I was thinking, I keep seeing all these stories where it's like, oh, Cam Newton's in quarantine because Cam Newton's infected. And then it's like he's starting the next week or the week after. You know what I mean? It's like he might not have the pep in his step. He had COVID. You can't really start at the NFL level as a quarterback <laughs> if you're not 100 uh, percent spell, especially Cam's you know, running game and everything, everything else. So then I started thinking, I keep hearing about these, you know, college athletes getting it, football players, Major League Baseball, NFL. Like every time I watch SportsCenter, like so-and-so for the 49ers, the cornerback, he's got it. He, they're scared he's infected some of the other teammates, so now they got a quarantine or whatever. I don't hear any stories about these guys even getting sick. I just hear them testing positive. I don't hear any buddies rush to the hospital. I don't hear, you know, oh, it's touch and go with, with Cam Newton. It's like all I hear is these guys get it, and then they're back. I, I, most of them, it seems like, don't want to even take the week off that's the upcoming game, but they're forced to quarantine. I think the uh, Clemson quarterback just had this happen to him, mm -hmm. and then they just come back. So this is – and now we have protocols that work, work better – and we have, you know, we have medicine and things and we figured some stuff out. But this doesn't seem to be anything to young, healthy, strong, uncompromised people. It really doesn't. I mean, otherwise, you know, when when this thing started, when they were talking about starting the college football season and and NFL, Mike August was like, oh, people are going to die. People are going to die. And I said, I don't think they're going to die because they're 19. 
and they're world class they, athletes. And they're world class athletes. Like they're not gonna, you know, no, somebody's gonna and it's true, some of the world class athletes are, you know, three hundred and seventy five pound interior linemen who are carrying a little extra weight, but where are all the stories about uh, the college guys dying or the pro guys dying or the, the guy um, for the Dodgers who got it and he played in the World Jason Series? Jason Turner? Yeah, Tur- Justin Turner. I Justin think. Turner. Yeah, where where's he? What's going on? Like, where are all the stories? Well, you know, it's funny you should say that, Brian. I'm sure this is a movie you've seen before. Not not uh, uh, recently, a couple weeks ago, I saw Contagion for oh, the yeah, first time, movie. which is uh, David Fincher, I think. No, uh, Steven Soderbergh. Thank you. I, I mix, mix them up and I have no idea why. But um, Adam, have you seen Contagion? You know, Gwyneth Paltrow, Matt Damon. Um, uh, it's lots of people. No, I, I, do I, don't, I don't think I have. And, well, I wanted I hadn't seen it. I know obviously what it's about. And, and the big story when this all the covid started was Contagion was the number one streaming movie on Netflix because right. people can't right. get enough, you know, right. craziness. And I thought, well, I got to see this. And my first thought, because that movie is if you're infected, you die. There's no there's no ifs, ands or buts that it doesn't matter how strong you are, how healthy, how young, how old. And you're watching this movie and it does seem sort of post apocalyptic and like a, like a horror movie. And my first thought after the movie was, well, thank God what we're dealing with isn't that, oh. you know, this is not this is not that. Well, this would be the I've said it. It'd be the worst movie ever. None of, none of these college guys are dying. None of these pro guys are dying. If this is a movie, the whole NFL would have to be taken out. So also, it's a little early because of all the election hubbub. But I have been saying I do kind of hope that this election comes sooner than later so we can stop all the fucking COVID talk and open the schools and all that shit. And now it's tough because all the election stuff is still, you know, all the plates are still spinning. But... This has been the first two day period I've not seen COVID all over, yeah, all over CNN. And I suspect now that, well, as long as Trump loses and they can't use it as a cudgel to beat Trump with, I think CNN may be done with uh, with COVID. Wow, they may yeah. it's going to be 90 percent less COVID talk now <laughs> that that. That that much that much we know. And then all the dumb, scared people can now get back to their lives, which would be nice. Well, Mm -hmm. just to clarify what you're saying about 90 percent less covid talk. Do you think it'll be 90 percent less in general or 90 percent less doom and gloom? It'll start saying the clouds are parting. Uh, Now things are starting to work. Now more vaccine oriented talk. Yeah, Yeah, I can see that. Yeah. Yeah, I could I could definitely see it. Yes, it'll be much less uh, doom and gloom uh, now that the uh, election's over. And less some, grim milestones. Somebody should uh, get Barbara Ferrer on and say, uh, all right, election's over. She said done, but uh, the health commissioner or whatever for L.A. County. Can we get the get the schools uh, back up and running? All right. I uh, you know, I'm obsessed with the, the side of the freeway. Mm hmm. Oh. And uh, it's come you, up once or twice, Junior. You guys have heard the, uh, I guess, the whole soliloquy about uh, how uh, the sprinkler can't. Uh, all the sprinkler's doing is growing weeds right. at the bottom of of the embankment when it's supposed mm-hmm. to be spraying the top of the embankment, and the sprinklers mm-hmm. are down at the bottom of the embankment, and they're aimed at these pepper trees, which haven't grown an inch. Uh, so yesterday, when I went over to explore. I I found you can you can show there's now puddles of oh water runoff. No, it's not runoff. It never gets up the fucking hill because it's being, dripped it down. The, yeah. the weed it's, is blocking the, the sprinkler. That's just offensive. Yeah. It's we're we, not that far removed from the drought. Like are we just going to make this a priority? Well, first off. Why not just put a fucking drip line where the tree is? Why shoot it from 20 feet away? And didn't everyone kind of know this was going to happen? This freeway, the now puddles of water, which are just going to grow more weeds or get uh, mosquito larva in it. That's right. There's no yep. chance that uh, that 
weed is so robust and so thick and so stout. There's no way an ounce of water can get past the weed no. to the tree. So every day it's just going to go off. I don't know how the tree's going to grow because the tree's not going to get any water. Like, the tree's essentially suffocating. Uh, uh, six months ago, they cleared the whole side to redo it. It is now back to exactly where it was. Like with a vengeance. I, I now here's this is an impossibility, Max Apata, but can we find who's in charge of this stretch of fucking <laughs> highway and go, what the fuck? Like what really? There should be a class action lawsuit against whoever designed this or executed. This is this of course first things first, it could never work. They literally had a weed-filled side of a freeway, and it's gone right back to a weed-filled side of a freeway because how else could it go? They did the yeah. exact same thing. I never knew an irrigation system could be passive-aggressive. Yes. Well, that's it, my feels, how, it feels very, like, happy now. <laughs> how yeah. expensive could that be to put in, like, an irrigation slash drip system, and wouldn't you save money over the long run because you're not indiscriminately spraying gallons of water on the side of the road? I do not know. I have <laughs> it's a reasonable question. I have queried many times when I see the sprinklers going off during a rainstorm on the side of a freeway. Oh, you'll see like, it this weekend. Hey, you can go to Home Depot and get a rain sensor. You know, they sell them. Every all the homeowners I know have a rain sensor in their yep. irrigation system because who wants to waste water when God is raining all over your shrubbery. Uh, well, I'll tell you, I'll tell you who doesn't care about it. The people who constantly inform you that we're living in a desert, we have drought like conditions and you need to conserve water. Right. Yep. Those are the same people that are creating puddles underneath their weed embankments at the bottom of the freeway and the ones who just fire off the rainbird during a rainstorm. So I ask you, do you want more of these people? Do we want more of this? Or can we no. fucking reel it in? And why is there nobody just in charge of anything? The other side of the freeway where you get on the freeway just has a perpetual dirt lot and a truck parked in the middle of it, a bunch of open boxes. Like that's just perpetually there. Just dirt, a truck that we probably paid $51,000 for. And just a bunch of open boxes and like uh, some garden hose just just oh. sitting there. That's just been just there. A little bit of everything. That's the been there for for years. All right. Hey, yeah. You know, I'm shocked that nobody's brought this up in general on local news, Twitter, anything. Um, you know how there was big fanfare when uh, the Dodgers came back from winning the World Series, and of course we can't have a parade or anything. So the big deal was as the plane was um, taxing back in to LAX, there were a giant giant like water salute with those oh, giant no, water trucks yeah. and i can't believe there's been no like are you fucking kidding me we're in a drought yeah and that that was their big welcome back and and i i'm just shocked that it hasn't come up well also you know this is california this is like the epicenter of the green new deal you know we're mm -hmm. constantly talking about resources and mm -hmm. not wasting resources and all that can't even look uh, first things first, we don't we don't need to be the first people to the party. Just fucking do what Arizona and Vegas does. Mm -hmm. They just the reason they don't have weeds is because they don't water because they put in the right plants for the right climate and they put the yeah. ground cover in. And then that's that. You get the fuck on with your life. Succulents and rocks would look great. Right. <laughs> like Brian said, ice plants are pretty. Everybody likes them. Put them in. I'm going to keep watching that weed. I'm going to monitor that weed. It's about Weed nine. It's about, it's about nine foot high now. And uh, pretty soon it's going to die. And then we're going to have all that burnt brown. looking brown and then, shit all over. If that isn't a fire hazard, I don't know what is. All that kindling when that turns uh, brown. Uh, yeah, we got to figure out who's in charge of this stretch. I would love to interview <laughs> that uh, human being. And what do you even ask for? What do you Google? What who is that highway? Is that landscaping? Well, what changes your well, if yeah. I if I talk to the person, I'm going to ask them initially for a PET scan. I want to know <laughs> if their fucking brain is functioning. Drink this barium. Right.
Well, last <laughs> last year in August, Garcetti appointed Rachel Malarch as LA's first ever city forest officer who would oversee the go. growth of Los Angeles' urban forest and help the city reach its goal to plant 90,000 trees by 2021. Well, they planted them, but it, shouldn't the goal be that they grow? That, yeah. <laughs> because those things ain't going to grow. It's it's a, it's 98 degrees outside right now, and uh, those, they ain't getting any water. It also shows you, like we always talk about genetic diversity and mutts and all that, <clears throat> The power of the weed, man. Relentless. Nobody planted that weed. That fucking weed found a way. And that <laughs> weed has gone from invisible, literally in the soil, mm -hmm. un unrecognizable, to robust. And those fucking pep those pepper trees, those purebred pepper trees have not fucking grown an inch. <laughs> Now yeah. it's true they're they're uh, they're Bogart and all the water, but think about how fucking powerful nature is when you kind of leave it alone. You know what I mean? Like nobody's cultivating that, no one's helping it along, no one's fertilizing it, no one even wanted it there, and no one even put it there. And that fucking weed has gone ballistic in the last four months. That's basically nature. All right. Yeah, and they, their roots are are thick. I mean, they're just sucking up every ounce of water. They're like well, carrots when you pull them out. It gets it gets all the water now because it is. But it's as if it's an evil weed. I'm going to block this water source. None of the water shall make it up the hill to uh, the evil pepper tree, and I will have all the water for my root ball. So yep. says evil weed. All right. Uh, let's take ourselves a quick break. Marshall Terrell, who's, uh, he's written many, 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 many books. And he's doing one on Steve McQueen, which I'm very interested in, uh, as a subject. He's, uh, done books on uh, Ken Norton, the boxer, Johnny Cash, Pete Maravich, Elvis Presley. I mean, it just keeps going and going. We'll take a, uh, quick break. We'll talk to, uh, Marshall Terrell right after this. It's time to check Adam's voicemail. Hey, Adam, I got one for you from the files of words that sound way too similar, yet mean the opposite thing. Uh, overt, meaning overtly out in the open, not trying to hide it. And covert, meaning the exact opposite clandestine, hidden. Anyway, I can't believe I didn't figure out one sooner. Later, man. You can leave us a message at 888-634-1744. Well, we have author, biographer, journalist, Marshall Terrell on the uh, Zoom. Good to see you, Marshall. Hey, thank you for having me. <clears throat> the book is called uh, Steve McQueen in His Own Words. It's available now on DaltonWatson.com. Over 450 quotes from McQueen from over five decades of uh, media coverage. Yeah, I'm into uh, Steve McQueen because I'm into uh, motorsports, and um, I have a bunch of Paul Newman cars, and I know they were kind of rivals a little bit back in the day. Um, McQueen died in 1980 at like 50 or something. He died. That's right. November 7th, 1980. So that, that anniversary is coming up on Saturday. Uh, and I guess, you know, better than most that, uh, Steve McQueen watches and bomber jackets and old Porsches are off the charts, uh, collectible. Why, why do you think after all these years, there's such an identification with Steve McQueen? Because look, just because you're a celebrity and you owned a car, nine times out of ten doesn't add much. I mean, it's like Paul McCartney's Ferrari didn't really get anything above that. Yes, Brian. That's the that's the Seinfeld joke. This is John Voight's car. <laughs> right, right. It just didn't. It doesn't. But for McQueen, he's such a cultural icon. But he became a cultural icon twenty five years after he died. Right. It's, it's tough to explain. Um, there are just certain icons that seem to do well in death. And uh, the McQueen estate makes anywhere from 5 to $10 million a year. 
just depending on what's out there. Um, and he transcends generations just like the Beatles, just like Elvis, just like certain movies do. So they, it's just it's a magical quality you can't quite put your finger on. They make five to ten million a year just on licensing deals. Yes, Brian. I was going to say, what what does the McQueen estate sell, or is it, is it residuals from movies? No, or, they like they license. No, but what? So then the question then is, who who licenses? What is there out there with Steve McQueen's image? Well, or? there's the Ford Motor Company that always uh, seems to put out a new bullet every couple of years in, in McQueen's name. Um, sun, sunglasses, that's a big market. Uh, um, watches, but, watches, watches, that's a big the big line. thing. Tag Hewer. Yeah. Um, almost anything that you can think of. I, and, and they're very picky about what they, they choose. Sure. Uh, they're all high end stuff. So, you know, McQueen represented, you know, fashion, motoring, um, you know, you name it. And there's, there's an element of the movies too. He produced a lot of his own movies and every time they're shown, there's a residual for the sure. fat. So um, more so than, than a normal uh, movie star would have. What, uh, I mean, I've heard some stories about the guy that makes him sound like not a great guy. <laughs> like that story of when he was in uh, France and they were filming Le Mans. He had his mistress uh, with him, who was his uh, young ingenue co-star. But I think he also had his assistant in the car as right. well. And could you tell us that story? Well, the story is is that uh, he was uh, he was loaded on cocaine and... Um, you know, he was he was with his mistress, and they were out taking a ride, um, and they cra they were in the French countryside, and they crashed through a barrier, and both McQueen and this lady went through the front windshield, fell out of the car and onto the lawn, and uh, you know he woke up, and uh, you know his his reaction was, oh shit, what's going to happen to my career, <laughs> he, with, without much thought of the young lady. Um, and then, of course, when he um, when he came to, she she came to as well. And um, the, um, the the first house that they came upon um, was was, an, was like an old French country house. And it was like two in the morning and the guy came out with a shotgun. And um, so then they had to just walk their way back into town. And um, but the, the the younger gentleman that you were talking about was was now a big time producer. Um, was his assistant at the time and he broke his arm. So he had to, you know, lug himself, you know, a couple miles uh, into town and, and then get help. But he also had to take blame for it later on. Uh, he, so the, the assistant was in the car too. Correct. Yeah. And, there were and, a couple people in the car and the assistant was just one of them. <laughs> so he told the assistant, uh, you're on your own. And uh, I think he told, uh, don't say anything. And, uh, say you crashed a car and then also the uh, i heard that the young co-star obviously had a big knot on her head from going through the windshield and he's like don't say anything you gotta put makeup on it so, right. so. and she didn't the say answer it. for everything yeah and she didn't say anything for 50 years there was a Le Mans documentary that came out a couple of years ago and she she finally kind of acknowledged all those things um and she just said she didn't want to make steve mcqueen feel bad so yeah, a different time. That's why they Very call different it, times. They call it the good old days for a reason. <laughs> Jeez, could you imagine that now? No, no, no way. TMZ would know before you went through the windshield. Yeah, the Frenchman <laughs> wouldn't have a shotgun if you have a phone. Maybe That's right. A picture. That's right. Um, also, did he have a rivalry? So I made a doc about uh, Paul Newman. And it was a little unclear to me whether I know him and Steve had the sort of thing on the billboard of towering inferno i guess and who's going to be first and who's going to be on top of and all that kind of stuff but did what was steve's thoughts about uh, newman well i'll say this the the rivalry was really kind of on mcqueen's end mcqueen always needed an adversary to sort of motivate him and so these two knew each other way back in the new york days in the 50s and uh and and we're in some acting lessons together as a matter of fact Joanne Woodward was in the same acting class as Steve McQueen. And, um, and so the, the, the first film that Steve McQueen did, first major film, was as a $19 a day extra called Somebody Up There Likes Me. And Paul Newman was the star. And Newman 
came from, I think, Shaker Heights, yeah. uh, Ohio, <laughs> one of the most affluent areas in the country at the time. And McQueen, uh, you know, was from the streets and he felt like the, the role of, uh, the, of Rocky Graziano belonged to him. You know, McQueen did a little boxing in his day. Adam, I just watched The Hammer last night. Was very impressed with your skills. Oh, thank and, you, um, Marshall. And um, so McQueen had always felt like that belonged to him and that he, he had watched a Newman who he had done acting classes with get the star treatment. And McQueen was a, was like a petulant child in a lot of ways. He wanted the star treatment. So he used Newman as a yardstick um, as uh, for success. And so it, it took 20 years for him to kind of reach that same level as Newman in, in the Tower and Inferno. And so when they get to the Tower and Inferno, this is a great story. Um, Sterling Silicon wrote the screenplay and Sterling was the, the, the number one screenwriter in Hollywood at the time. And he was out on a deep sea fishing expedition and McQueen looked at the script and he noticed, you know, that McQueen had X amount of lines and, and Newman had X amount of lines and he wanted theirs to be the same exact amount. And so he somehow or another got uh, Sterling Silicon back, uh, back to land and made him make those changes. And so that, that kind of stuff went on with McQueen all the time. He was on her. So he's a diva. A diva, yes. But, it, and I'm not trying to make excuses for him, but if you understand the insecurity and the childhood that he had, you, you understand the reasons why. He grew Very up. Very insecure. Uh, he grew up in, uh, like, I don't I don't know if it would be called foster care, but didn't he spend time in like a boys club and kind of an orphanage and stuff? Yeah, he spent time out there uh, in Chino, California, Boys Republic. It, it was a reform school. So it's not too far from where you guys are. As a matter of fact, every year there, they have a Steve, McQu Steve McQueen car show that raises close to half a million dollars for, for this school. Um, and so, yes, he was he spent uh, 18 months there before he joined the Marines. Was he I, I never hear about his family or his parents. Well, it's pr pretty sad. He grew up with both of his parents were alcoholics. Mm -hmm. uh, his father took a hike when he was six months and was a merchant marine. Um, and, and he was a big drinker throughout his whole life. When I, when I found out who his dad was, I saw his, the, the uh, death certificate. Uh, he died of cirrhosis of the liver. His mother was a party girl. Um, she wasn't around much either. She kind of farmed him off to relatives. So he grew up, he kind of went back and forth between Indianapolis, Slater, Missouri, and Los Angeles. And uh, every time uh, the mother came back into his life, there was a new man. New man would always end up beating Steve. Uh, so, I mean, a really, really tough childhood. He's just cashing in on that white privilege, you know, from back in the day. <laughs> yeah, people yeah. people never really realized, like, how many fucked up poor white people were and are in this country. Like, this, this is how people grew up. I mean, a lot of people grew up back then. Um, Brian had a question. I, I cut him off. What was no, it's it? Okay. If, if I can go back to, uh, Newman and, uh, McQueen just for a minute, it, it struck me and please, by all means, I'm floating a theory. So feel free to crap all over it. It almost feels like a Salieri Mozart kind of thing because Paul Newman, I think of as a great actor, Steve McQueen, I think of as a great movie star. Do you know what I mean? Like it feels right. like he was constantly, um, measuring himself against the success, but also I wonder about like the ability. I mean, Steve McQueen, as magnetic as he was on screen, I don't ever think of as like a great actor, like the way I do Paul Newman. Uh, you're right, but but he was a great film actor, um, and he made you feel things. You, the, the the beauty of his acting was that when you watched him, he did he was dyslexic, so what he tried to do was cut a lot of his lines, and so. When you saw him act, he, he made up for it in that he, he gave you an emotion that would say five pages of dialogue. Mm -hmm. um, Newman was just the opposite. You know, Newman, uh, you're right. Newman was a great actor. McQueen was a great film actor. Um, they both came at it from, from, from different uh, angles, uh, but they were both very similar in a lot of ways. Um, but I, I think you're, you're dead on with that observation. All right, whenever you're over. Did uh, Newman know, oh, sorry. Uh, Oh, uh, yeah, I was going to I was going to launch into the motorsport side of it because I know he's insane. He was insane lover of all motorsports. But 
Gina, you ask your question first. And yeah. Then we'll do OK, that. thanks. Uh, d- was Newman aware of this sort of one way rivalry? Was he because he does seem like, you know, what we know about Paul Newman, just the nicest and, yeah. you know, Mr. Congeniality. Was he even aware that there was a rivalry or did he care? He knew, especially on the set of the Tower Inferno. I forget the gentleman's name, but he wrote a book. Uh, he was his best friend who, who, who ran all of his business stuff. Um, and if you said his name, I'd know it. But anyway, there's an anecdote in his book where you know Newman um, Newman knew about the twelve the, the the lines of dialogue, and he was complaining to his buddy. And, and the, I think the exact quote was, "Do you know what chicken shit gets on by?" Well, let me tell you this story. And so. Yeah, he definitely knew that that was going on. Uh, so famously, so so McQueen was a pretty accomplished uh, motorsports guy. I I think probably his best accomplishment was Sebring. I think he drove in the twelve hours of Sebring. So the again the 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 trifecta is twenty four hours of Le Mans. It's uh, twenty four hours of Daytona. And it's uh, 12 hours of Sebring. And I think he drove with a, like a cast on his foot or something. They, right. He fucked his foot up doing a, some enduro motorcycle thing or something before. He literally drove this. And, and he wasn't in this sort of GT or modified class. He was in the kind of open. I don't know. I think he's probably driving a Ferrari or a Porsche. I can't remember which one. But he was driving the real deal top of the food chain kind of kind of car so like in sebring there might be a ferrari modified you know oh he's porsche 908 yeah there might be a car like that there might also be like an mg sports car with some modifications and it's just going to get lapped five thousand times by the by the 908 but but the 908 is the top of the food chain for for cars and they're they're difficult real real race cars and he drove that thing with a cast on his foot right that's right yeah he did he did break his foot uh i think a week before um but keep in mind that it wasn't just him driving it was peter Rebson who was his partner but they were competing against mario andretti at the peak of his career and when when andretti realized that that they had a quite a uh quite a match on their hands he Andretti was said to have said in the pits, I can't let, I can't lose, lose to some actor. I'll never live it down. Right. And so Andretti was extra motivated to, to beat him on that day. I'm always morbidly interested. What year was that? Like 71 or something? 1970, March of 70. <clears throat> March of 70. Look up when P- Peter Revson probably died in an F1 car two, two and a half years uh, later right. or wh- whatever. You can look it up, Max. But the, the saddest thing about all these old races is when you go, Oh, he drove with this guy, or these were the three guys on his Le Mans team. You go look up those three guys. Two of them died within five years in a motor in a motor racing uh, accident. Uh, He died in Peter Refson died March, 1974. So he made it, he didn't make it past five years from uh, that race. Those guys just routinely died. Right. And And in in Le Mans, you know, one of the racers there lost his leg. Um, you know, McQueen gave some of the proceeds of that film to him. Oh, film in um, Le Mans, yeah. Yeah, and I think it was a Joe Siffert that, that Lo- Joe Siffert was in Le Mans. He had passed away, too, uh, a few years after that, making of that film. Where, so you're absolutely right. Where's he? So um, McQueen did Sebring, and he obviously wanted to race at Le Mans, as well and i think maybe he wanted to film lamar and race at lamar but the studio wouldn't let him that's correct he was going to race with uh, jackie stewart in Le Mans, and then the film company told him that you know insurance wise you couldn't do it so the what they were going to do is they were going to film him in the race and then the very next day they were going to start filming the movie mm-hmm. um but when when he got word that um he wasn't going to be able to to race he did not. He was supposed to wear his racing uniform in in the, in the race as part of the film, but he wouldn't do that because he felt like that he would have been um, a fake and a phony. Mm-hmm. And so he cost that movie production a lot of money by not going out there on the track in his uniform 
when he was supposed to be making that film. But again, he had such great respect for racers, he just couldn't bring himself to do that. So he, he was supposed to get in his fire suit and shoot stuff of him in the pit or him getting out of the car while the other cars were whizzing by and the crowd and all that. And he just wouldn't do it. That and he was supposed to race in it. He, he wanted yeah. to actually jump in the car and start racing. Um, God, I just thought of a sad thing with his uh, rival with, uh, with Paul Newman because um, – McQueen's if if you're a motorsports guy like McQueen was then the 24 hours of Le Mans is the granddaddy that's Valhalla that's 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 the goal the goal especially for the gentleman racer guys like Steve McQueen the goal is to get to Le Mans uh Steve McQueen died in 1980 do you know what month November, right? November 7th. Yeah. This Saturday will be the 40th oh, anniversary. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, in 1979, Paul Newman, his team won his class in Lamar. So he got <laughs> that, as, that. He got that as a parting gift. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So his rival did Lamar and was successful at Lamar, you know, a, a year before, before McQueen died, but McQueen was sick for a while, right? Right. Yeah. He was, he was sick for a, a good year before he had passed on, but I do want to go back to Newman. When Newman started getting into racing, McQueen felt that he was encroaching on his territory. So he was jealous in that way as well. <laughs> like he just couldn't have one thing for himself. Exactly. I guess all I got left of the, left of the salad dressing. <laughs> <laughs> Adam, you know, the way you were talking about racers and sort of how expendable they were at the time, but how tough and sort of heroic they were. I never thought about them like this, but they're almost like our gladiators. Yeah. You're going to hurt. You get hurt. You're probably going to die, but you're going to live as a hero while you're fighting. Yeah. And, you know, so many of these guys just never even saw their 30th birthday. Um, so I'm looking down on the page here. I love motorsports, but I also love boxing. And mm -hmm. I see that you did one on Ruth Pointer of the Pointer Sisters. Now, you did one on Ken Norton. Right. What do Ken we... Norton, Ernie Shavers, and Aaron Pryor. I did three boxing books. Oh, you did Aaron Pryor. Yes. And I got to hang out with him, too. It was just pretty wild. Aaron Pryor was, he's little spoken of, but one of the most devastating, I don't know, middleweight, guys out there he had these epic wars with uh alexis arguello right right and alexis arguello it, it was almost it's heart heartbreaking so so prior ha had the sort of famous he's in the corner and his corner man is named panama lewis and panama and 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 prior, they just fought this 15 round. I don't know. Where was it? Like, how hot was it out? It, it was in Miami. It was humid. And yeah, Arguello had to quit because he thought he was going to die. It was one of those, it was one of those fights when they would go 15 rounds and they would do them in these hot, balmy things. And, and some guys would just, I mean, uh, I mean, that's what happened with, uh, Joe Frazier and Muhammad Ali, like they, you just, at some point you think you're going to die. Like Muhammad Ali thought he was going to die. And I guess, uh, Frazier's corner thought he was going to die and, and stopped it in the 14th round or whenever it was. But Panama Lewis famously <laughs> did the, uh, hand me the water. And then he goes, uh, no, hand me the other water. The one I mixed. <laughs> and it's like, uh, no one's shady about that. Right. <laughs> yeah. So, that 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 was an incredible fight. Alexis Arguello was like the pride of where was he from? Nicaragua. It was Nicaragua. He was the the biggest star in Nicaragua. He was good looking. He was this great great boxer. He was probably unbeaten. He ran into Pryor, and Pryor just never stopped throwing punches. And maybe that's because of what he was drinking, but he just. <laughs> He just got to Arguello. They had a second fight. Pryor took it to him early. Arguello just kind of quit. And then I think he committed suicide at some at some point uh, later. Many, many years later, he did, yes. Yeah. yeah. I, I don't know the reason for that. They just, 
he just couldn't he just seemed broken by by prior and it was just such a classic fight i mean you'll ne- you'll never see those kind of fights again so uh ken norton what do we need to know about him ken was a lot of fun um i went to let's see we did a couple signings with him and we went to a, a native american reservation and they were in awe of him they thought that he was like you know we, we talked about the warriors of the old and um so um these guys, we walked into this big, big boardroom, which was very private. And there must have been 15 Indian chiefs there. And he walks in and he looks at me and he looks at them. And, and he had this gravelly voice and he says, why are all the white, why do all the white, white people try to keep us apart? <laughs> <laughs> and, and all these native chiefs just broke up laughing. And it was just, it was one of the funniest moments I'd ever experienced in my life. But he, he, he was just right on the money. He was funny. He had a lot of fun with his fame. He, he, he was a good guy. He was a brick shit house. that guy. I mean, that guy was built, uh, Brian knows, because his uh, son played linebacker in the yeah, NFL. the Niners and the Cowboys, yeah. Well, they're really estranged. That's the story I always heard in the '90s was that they weren't on speaking terms. That's true. They they were, but they made up for. They uh, I talked to the son, and and they were estranged for a time, um, and that had to do, you know, with 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 uh, who he had married, but it had nothing to do with who she was as a person. But uh, yeah, they were estranged for a bit, but they got back together again. Is Ken Norton still with us? No, he he had passed. Uh, couple of years Holy ago. Shit. And, and you know, he was still in good shape like that when he passed. <laughs> there is, he looks like a statue of David. We're yeah. looking at, he looks like a, he looks a lot better than David. I mean, <laughs> that guy, what a fucking specimen. He Holy said he never shit. worked out either. He said that I was know. all natural. I hate, oh I hate these guys. It's, it's all <laughs> genetics. It's all goddamn genetics. Cause, uh, like uh, I've told these guys before, one of the guys Ken Norton probably fought was uh, Mike Weaver, and Mike Weaver was another fucking brick shit house who I who lived in my apartment in Santa Monica for a while, and I used to work out, used to work at the Bodies in Motion with him. But uh, these guys just crazy genetics. But you know the thing about crazy genetics is you take a look at Muhammad Ali with his shirt off and he was kind of smooth, you know, didn't have big veins bulging everywhere and the chiseled abs. He was kind of smooth. You take a look at Ken Norton. He, he looks like a comic book character with a shirt off. You take a look at Mike Weaver that, but the best in that whole group was the smooth guy. Right. It's, it's such, it's such a crazy thing. It's like, it's the, uh, is that Mike Weaver? Yeah. Jesus. Mike Hercules Weaver. Holy fucking shit. Look at the, uh, is it the traps? Is that the back muscle that I can see from the front? That's insane. But, you know, he would get beat by smooth guys or like Mexican guys with a gut on them, you know? And so, you know, the moral of the story is, is there's two genetic hands there's the genetic hand of what you look like with your shirt off. And then there's the, the genetic hand of athleticism. And so Muhammad Ali got the genetic hand of athleticism, but a little less on what you look like with your shirt off. But the athleticism, that hand, that genetic hand always beats the guy who looks like a muscle, looks like a bodybuilder. Um, so uh, McQueen Final uh, final thoughts on on McQueen. Um, he seemed like he was kind of a a tortured soul. Was he a tortured soul? I would say so. He, he certainly, um, yeah. He would he would say one thing, do another. Um, very insecure guy. Uh, very complex. I mean, that's what makes him uh, a great, interesting character study. Um, you know, he. Um, he, he, in, in, there's a great quote in the book about him talking about running up against red lights his whole life. And then he gets to Hollywood, he becomes famous. And then everything starts turning up green lights. And he talked about green lights can be a problem too. So he never really had a normal life. You know, he had this, this torturous upbringing and then all of a sudden he's invited to Candyland and he's given everything. He's, he's granted every wish that he wants. So there, there's no way that he could have turned out normal. 
Does he have family? Are there people, children, people surviving? Yes. He, had, he had two kids. Um, Chad is still alive and his daughter. Oh, that's right. Yeah. His daughter, Terry, died at the age of 38 of a rare iron deficiency called hemochromatosis. Mm. So there's a lot of tragedy in that family. It's also kind of weird because I've, I've seen Chad McQueen at a few motorsport events and stuff like that. It's a, it's a kind of a weird, be careful what you wish for, because when your dad is Steve McQueen, that seems like a pretty good childhood. You get all the cool mini bikes and you live in the house in Malibu and stuff, but you kind of go through your life as Steve McQueen's son, right? Like Chad McQueen's, his job is kind of being son of Steve McQueen. Well, right. And, and you know, Paul Newman's son had that, that situation as well. Chad seems to have done w relatively well. And I, I, I will credit McQueen for this. He was a really good dad. He was a stern father. And Chad, uh, growing up, worked at a gas station. His dad didn't give him anything. And he made him work uh, at this Malibu gas station. I think if you take the drive up the coast, that gas station's still there. It's the 76. And oh. his, his dad didn't give him any cars. He made him work for everything. So, uh, you know, Chad actually turned out okay. He did what okay. are you talking about? <laughs> oh, that's sunny. Yeah. He, um, I think, oh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Karate Kid. Karate Kid. I forgot Dutch. about that. Yeah. Um, Dutch. Yeah, I think I think Newman's son died when Newman was like uh, twenty six. I uh, or when he was twenty six. Sadly, uh, let's see. So uh, let's give a plug here. Steve McQueen, in his uh, own words, and uh, you can uh, get that. By the way, it's available on DaltonWatson dot com. Marshall Terrell, thanks for joining us. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. We'll take a quick break. We'll come back with the news right after this. Give me the news with Grad. News with Gino Grad. Breaking viral. All those crazy Trump tweets. Give me news with Gino Grad. Trouble in the Middle East. Celebrity drunk meltdowns. Seek news with Gina Gino Grad. The news with Gina Grad. Well, the. Election Michigas continues, so we'll just sort of let that simmer until we get uh, until we get more hard information. But for now, there's some other election stuff that's pretty interesting. Tito Ortiz, oh, you've yeah. heard of him? You've met him? Uh, you, he's he's been in the studio, right? Yeah, I think I remember. he won uh, something in Long Beach, right? He he won a seat for city council in Huntington Beach, California. Oh, Huntington Beach. Well, yeah. he, he was known as the Huntington Beach bad boy, so seems like well, a guy you'd want on in your council, your city right? Council. Yeah. He, the former UFC champ was elected to the position with uh, almost 35,000 votes, 14% of the vote, uh, giving him the highest showing out of 15 candidates running for uh, city council. Tito's a supporter of Trump who appeared on The Celebrity Apprentice 2007. Says he uh, he it says he aspirates, but that can't be right. He aspires, I assume, to become the mayor of I Huntington Beach. <laughs> yeah. He does choke uh, people joking. out for a living. That's, true. That's yeah. right. His campaign slogan was make Huntington Beach safe again. And he has twin sons with uh, Jenna Jameson. Not sure how involved she will or won't be with this. Probably, and, uh, probably safe distance. Kind of a hands off. If I know those two kids. Um <laughs> Yeah, he's he's a, an impressive dude. He's you know, he's not uh, intellectually necessarily at the top of the heap. Boxing is checkers and MMA is chess. And he, can, but just chess. But he fucking makes up for it with hard work. Like that dude is just hard working dude. And he just got. He's a perfect example of one of those guys who kind of grew up on the wrong side of the tracks and his mom was a mess and his family was a mess and everything was a mess, but he found his way into wrestling and wrestling is so insanely disciplined. You know, I mean, there's just wrestling is one of those sports where there, there is no shortcuts or life hacks. It's like you're either in the gym, sweating off the pounds, running the bleachers or you're, or you're getting beat. Or you're not making weight. So that just in, intense. And it's also very, 
singular, you know, it's like, it's just you and the other guy. So there right. is no dogging it, you know, sometimes, you know, when you play football and there's 50 guys out on the field and you're like running wind sprints, there's always a group of like 14 guys that are kind of lagging behind and mm -hmm. you can kind of lo lose yourself in that group. Like you don't have to go or sometimes you're playing practice and you're playing defensive end and they run a sweep to the other side of the field and you don't really have to chase the guy, you know, the play's going away from you. In theater rehearsal terms, it's called marking it. I'm just going to mark it today. I'm not going to do a full out. Yeah. And no marking it in wrestling. Like you just, right. and, and then you, and then you factor in the weight. You got to make weight. Mm -hmm. And you had no interest in, in like high school wrestling, right? Like you didn't do that. I don't think my high school had wrestling. It was one well, of the, that answers the question. One of the weirder, one of the many weird things about my high school, no swimming pool. Did you guys have swimming pools? Yeah. Yes. The swimming pool of my high school is used to uh, film of uh, the underwater scenes in Star Trek four because I had a window, uh, which at the time was uh, pretty advanced. God wow. damn. What the fuck? I, I swear. I just I, had a regular I, old pool. I tell everyone my childhood, I was punished. It wasn't like it was fair to Midland. Like every, my bosses were all fucking evil. My high school didn't have a pool or wrestling. My high school, the swim team in my high school had to walk about two miles up the road and use the Y, the Y's oh, yeah. swimming pool mm -hmm. over, over on there. Laurel. Yeah. So we had, yeah. we had, it was on, uh, no, no, no. S go ahead. Yeah. You'd go down Magnolia and yep. you go to like a Tahunga or something or, or right before Kawanga the North Hollywood diner. Right. Turn right. And there they, yeah. they would go, they would go there. So yeah, we didn't have wrestling and we didn't have a swimming pool either. But anyway, Tito, I would much rather have a guy who calls chess chest with the crazy work ethic than whoever the fuck knows how to pronounce chess who's working on the side of this fucking freeway here, watering all watering all the dirt. All the dirt. Yes, I, I, I guarantee that person didn't wrestle at that high level. Well, 35,000 other people in Huntington Beach agreed with you. Mm -hmm. So I'll be curious as to what, what he gets done down there. We'll, we'll keep an eye out. Um, another winner uh, from a small town in northern Kentucky, um, and these stories exist because they just keep happening, elected a dog as their mayor on Tuesday. This is Wilbur Beast. He's a French bulldog, and he won the election in, ra in rabbit hash with over 13,000 votes. The race was the biggest turnout ever with a total of 23,000 votes cast. Wilbur Beast is not the first dog to lead the town. This is sort of what they do. They've been doing this since the 90s. The residents cast their vote by writing in their preferred dog's name on a ballot and then donate a dollar to the Rabbit Hash Historical Society. So it's kind of a, a cute little joke. The first elected mayor in the history of Rabbit Hash was a dog named Goofy Bornaman Calhoun. Wow, he was don't tell that to Emily Ratajkowski. Yeah. <laughs> she fucking wants no part. She was probably thinking about vacationing in rabbit hash, but right, uh, sure. not, not anymore. anymore. Mm -mm. And uh, he ran, he, he had that uh, office for four terms. Um, this year, Wilbur defeated the rescue pit bull and incumbent mayor, Brenneth Paltrow, mm. who was elected in 2017. Um, and you can't just be any old dog and do this. Every aspiring candidate must be able to chase a rabbit from their home to the rabbit hash town center within one hour uh, to be considered eligible for mayor. Wow. Congratulations, on. Wilbur. I got to tell you, <clears throat> I used to make fun of these towns, but ever since passing the Armageddon landscape of homeless people mm -hmm. and junkies flopped everywhere, I could use a little down home cooking these days. You know what it's a great indicator of? Hmm. Northern Kentucky is out of problems. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they've made it. It's they've reached the top of the mountain. Let's just keep electing dogs because they're funny. Hey, Max Bata, check into their irrigation system over there at Rabbit <laughs> Hatch, and let's see if I might make that move or not, all right? Just Google that shit. <laughs> Max Bata, like, seriously, how do I find out who's in charge of the stretch of freeway? I'll, I'll find a way to find it. All right. Sorry.
By the way, so, I have yeah. I, I have a rich history of trying to get people that are horrible at their jobs to come on the air with me. They no. never do. They're pretty averse. <laughs> they, Shocking. They hate microphones. People that are people that are really good at their job love microphones. People that are horrible at their job hate them. You know what? Just a little um, pre, a little, a little production side conversation. You know who Chris, who I should put you in touch with, who somehow gets everyone to come on the show and they never come back twice. Ray, John and Ken's producer. Oh, really? How they get these people on and then they get on the air and just are lambasted because they can't answer any of the questions. Right. I'll, I'll, I'll ask. I'll see if we can get up, get him to get on this. Um, New Jersey's comprehensive ban on single use plastic and paper bags, which you don't really hear about, was signed into law on Wednesday, marking what some claim is the strongest measure against single use bags in the nation. So the new law prohib prohibits all store and food service businesses statewide from using these items, as well as disposable food containers and cups made out of uh, poly polystyrene foam. That starts May of 2022. So food service businesses will only be able to provide single use plastic straws and you have to ask for them. That starts next year. Unclear on what they're going to put the food in. Uh, while some states impose a fee on paper bags, New Jersey says no paper bags. Mm. So this is going to be interesting because remember how quickly paper and plastic bags came back because of COVID. You're not allowed to bring your own bag in and out of the store. Sure. So maybe they think it'll be done by then. I don't know. But they, they frown upon tote bags right now in grocery stores and things like that. For germ reasons? Is yeah. That yeah. Yeah. Or if you bring your own bags, you have to pack your own groceries. That That's the word on the street. at sprouts. I was just there. Oh, I had a, a fairly. <laughs> Brian's dream. I had a fairly comprehensive talk with Drew about surfaces and wiping stuff down. And, you know, we all, you know, seemed like yesterday my daughter was yelling at me. I had to take my shoes off before I came into the house. And they were like had the alcohol spritzer and they were like spritzing the fast food containers and they would Delicious. some people would let their shit sit out in quarantine for a while, you know, before they brought it in the house. And I said, I don't really hear any talk about surfaces anymore. People were wearing gloves. It's all about airborne spittle mucus, er, everything. Droplet. And uh, Drew's like, yeah, never really was a thing that they didn't know it at the time. Thank God I never fucking wiped anything down. But the point is, is, it's not it doesn't seem to be about the surfaces and the the fomites as uh, Drew would call it the the contact the stuff it's it's all airborne now so why are they freaked out over the satchels or are we just in kind of cruise? I don't think we've caught up yet just like, just think, is yeah. the policy but have you guys heard any talk at all in like the last two months about surfaces no. it's, it's all been masks it's all I mean, been it aerosol and it's interesting because they did find out like, well, you know, so far as we know, it can live on stainless steel for three days or cardboard for two days or whatever. And that's all really interesting. But is the point that it, it's not infectious because we don't really care about it anymore? I, it, it, it just seems. Or the odds of you touching a surface with it on it is low. The way you get it is from somebody sneezing, uh, you know, or it going singing or you know, aerosolize. aerosolize. Yeah. Just coughing, just putting it out there. Yeah. That seems to be the way you get it. I don't, I haven't heard anything about surfaces no. in, in, in months. So you think they could get those bags back. All right. Yeah, let the, me, uh, yeah. the chief of pediatric infectious diseases at UC Davis children's hospital last month did an interview and said that it is theoretically possible to get catch it from surfaces, but highly unlikely you need a unique sequence of events and uh, the, someone would need to get a large enough amount of the virus on a surface to cause that infection. So it's uh, with, then without washing your hands, you'd have to touch your eyes, nose, or mouth afterwards. So it's so unlikely. So have to be a crazy situation like being at a Sprouts with a beach bag. <laughs> yeah. Something like that. <laughs> Something, Something absurd. Yeah. Yeah. Ghoulish like that. <laughs> Ugh. Think about all the people and all the uh, wiping and all the shoes and all the spritzing of the bags and everything's got to go in a house. Oh, God. Thank 
God, I never did any of that shit. All right, let me tell you about uh, Simply Safe break ins rise during the holidays. Well, that makes sense. So, Simply Safe is having a huge holiday sale 30% off any system and a free security camera. Whether you're traveling or staying put for the holidays, check it out 30% off plus free security camera. Uh, the deal, it'll end this week. So let's get going. We love Simply Safe. I have Simply Safe. I've always used Simply Safe. Peel and stick. Batteries last up to 10 years up and running in under an hour. U.S. News and World Report calls it the best home security of 2020. An arsenal of sensors and cameras. And that's how Simply Safe does it. They're the best. I recommend them highly. It's Simply Safe, right, Dawson? Get 30% off Simply Safe plus a free security camera today by visiting simplysafe.com slash Adam. Go today. The deal is this week only. That's simplysafe.com slash Adam. Simplysafe.com slash Adam. All right. Let's do two more, Gina. All right. Well, I'm glad you brought up Simply Safe. And I don't know if you were watching the news last night, but somebody took a very expensive car that we just talked about oh, yeah. on a major joyride and we have some of the footage from how it ended it started in malibu and ended up in the valley uh you know reseda and sino sherman oaks this is a well i don't know if you can tell from there any guesses on what truck we're looking at well it's a, a three axle truck meaning it has two wheels and back it, you don't really do the wheels because a dually has two wheels and back but it only has two axles so this has three axles in it oh well i don't think they do a three axle raptor unless somebody modified it you know there are this, places that modify them a modified velociraptor oh with all the fixins i think they and just it, call it a raptor oh well they said stories us all calls it a velociraptor but i assume that is the raptor it's got it's got to be the same thing oh, it says oh Hennessy velociraptor. oh okay so so hennessy does big time modifications on on cars. And what Hennessy did is they took a raptor and made it into a Velociraptor by Hennessy. That's that's where the oh. confusion I is. I knew you'd be able to translate this. Yes. So here so we were watching this live and you know it, it came from Malibu that they were saying it was maybe what a $300,000 car yeah truck, uh, and yeah. uh trying to figure out so we went online immediately and tried to google celebrities with this truck couldn't figure it out there were a couple of guesses ended up being wrong so the situation is producer and dj marshmallows custom truck was stolen from the dealership and taken on a joy ride that turned into this big police chase and eventually a crash into a pole near my uh, Taco Bell over here. Law enforcement sources told TMZ this truck was stolen from a local Ford dealer Wednesday while it was getting serviced. TMZ was told the keys were in the truck. The guy just hopped in, hit the town. And finally, after pulling into this Taco Bell parking lot, it tore out and crashed into a utility pole while trying to make a turn. This thing is giant. And the suspect was arrested for felony evading and possession of a stolen car. Yeah, not much turning radius, but I got to say disappointing because I've seen and, and you you have too as well. Gina, it's an obnoxious, by the way, that's an obnoxious truck. But so here's the it thing. Is. Here's the thing. Uh, I'm guessing whoever owned that truck, not a Biden voter. That's I'm going to go out on a limb. Number two, um, disappointing, disappointing. Because this truck has, it's a like a double dually rear end. It's got the six wheels and the three axles. Hennessy, Hennessy takes, uh, takes, uh, uh, he, he, I'm trying to think of uh, his, uh, his Vipers. He takes Dodge Vipers and gets like a thousand horsepower out of them, right? So, this truck's got a thousand horsepower, huge knobby tires, a big, you know, 30 inch, 30 inches of ground clearance. Yeah. This guy makes fucking half a U-turn, hits a fucking <laughs> mailbox and climbs out of the car. He could have yeah. he could have driven this thing all the way to fucking Baja Peninsula if yeah. he wanted. And no law enforcement could have stopped him. Meanwhile. They even, let me just tell you, they threw down spike strips, popped a tire, I think, and it, it made no difference. I have seen, the guy just banged into a post and got out of the car. I have seen guys in 
Ford Aero Stars that were made in the 90s with, uh, you know, 700,000 miles on them, hauling ass down the uh, 210 freeway with like three fucking flat tires and and, and sparks shooting out. They mm-hmm. never slow down. That's right. They get off. They That's plow right. through a couple of intersections, mm-hmm. hit a mm-hmm. pedestrian. They get back on the freeway. At some yep. point, they want to get to their house out in Pacoima. It's like yep. th- they, they're driving literally minivans or Isuzu iMarks or whatever, just piles of shit from the 90, 90s. And this shit goes on for 300 miles. Yeah. This guy's, this guy's driving a fucking tank. He hits a post. He gets out of the car. Yeah. Sorry. That is that is some weak sauce, bro. <laughs> yeah, because he was just going south the whole time on the 101 and the freeways were clear. So, yeah, the, the minute he, there's a little trouble, he uh, waves the white flag. You got to go toward the fucking high desert, man. You got to get off the road on that yeah. thing. Now the fuzz ain't going to catch you there. All right. One more. <laughs> Sure. Um, so while we're on the subject, uh, because we were talking about these these Jeeps and cars and trucks that we had ne- I'd never heard of. Jeep has I was going to show you this new uh, custom gladiator that's ready to roll. I don't know if you've seen this one yet Mm-mm. in more ways than one. The gladiator top dog. It's a concept is uh, parts and accessories showcase built for SEMA, which is taking place virtually, as we talked about. So it's a four by four pickup. It's been reimagined as the ultimate mountain biking base camp with auxiliary lighting, rack rails, a two inch lift kit, roof racks for bikes and gear and a PCOR flatbed storage system in place of the bed that's packed with some entry interesting accessories. If you can open the door in the back, there it is. It comes with shelves, a refrigerator, a hot dog roller grill. So like yeah. you said, making a statement about getting off the grid. I think this is your vehicle. This, by the way, these two vehicles are why the terrorists hate us. Mm -hmm. Number one. Number two, it's the Gladiator Top Dog. Yeah. I don't sit down in anything that has the word Gladiator and Top in it. I feel like that is a little too homoerotic for me. You're asking, you're just asking for trouble. You just are. Yeah. (laughs) It sounds like an invitation. (laughs) That's right. It's an invitation to sodomy. All right. Uh, Shall we bring it home, Gina Grad? Let's bring it home. I'm Gina Grad, and that's the news. Gina, Gina Grad! That was the news with Gina Grad. Well, last but not least, we have Geico. Do you own? Do you rent? Well, you got to do one or the other, and you work hard out there. You want to make something easy? Bundle policies at Geico. Geico makes it easy to bundle your homeowners and renters insurance along with your auto policy. It's a good thing, too, because uh, you already got so much to do around the house. So go to Geico.com, get a quote, and see just how much you could save and make it Geico easy. Visit Geico.com today. That is Geico.com. All right. West Palm Beach Improv doing live stand-up there and live podcasts at the uh, Improv that Friday, Saturday, and we'll do... uh, Matinee, Reasonable Doubt over there. Burbank, Pickwick Bowl, everybody. Whoa, nice. doing like a parking lot show December 12th. So that's out here in uh, Burbank at Pickwick. And uh, it's a drive-in show. Yeah, oh, it's a car show and a stand-up show. So bring your car, drive it in. We'll have some uh, We'll have some fun over there. Naples, Florida, off the hook, January uh, 16th and 17th. We're doing live podcasts there. And... Uh, Check out me and Jeff Ross. We'll do a one-on-one on on the Stereo app uh, this Monday, 2 o'clock Pacific. So, until next time, this is Adam Kroll for Marshall Terrell and Gina Grad and Ball Bryan saying mahalo. Mahalo.